Chapter Twenty Two of Whither Thou Goest by William Lequeux. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Twenty Two. In a shabby room of a shabby house in one of the most obscure quarters of Madrid, five men were sitting. They were Contreras, Zerilto, Alvedero, Moreno, and Somoza, the fisherman of Fantarabia. Guy Rossett is here in the next room. It was Moreno who spoke. He turned to the fisherman. Has he recovered sufficiently, Somoza? The fisherman answered. He is still a little bit dazed a minute ago when I left him. The handkerchief I flung over his face contained a pretty strong dose. I should give him another ten minutes before he is ready to face the tribunal. The capture had been easy. Guy Rossett, reckless of danger, had left his flat to pay his visit to Isabel Clandon. Two members of the secret police were ready to accompany him. Fearful of compromising Isabel, he had rather roughly dispensed with their services. Reluctantly, they had obeyed him. They agreed between themselves that an Englishman was always pig-headed, a bit of a daredevil, and inclined to take risks. Guy walked carelessly along. He was in rather good spirits. He had received that day a cheerful note from Moreno that everything was going well, that very soon the heads of the anarchist movement in Spain would be laid by the heels. Of course, in this letter, Moreno did not explain his methods. If he had done so, Guy might not have been in quite such high spirits. For at this moment, playing his very difficult game of saving Guy Rossett, saving himself and Violet Hargrave, and also snaring the anarchist, Moreno could only give his full confidence to one man, his old friend and companion, Maurice Farquhar. As a matter of fact, Rossett never knew what had really taken place that night. He was never told that Moreno knew of his projected visit to Isabel that evening from a random remark of hers dropped in the afternoon, that he had set Somoza and another tall Biscayan fisherman to follow him for the purpose of bringing him to the house where the heads of the anarchist movement were assembled in solemn conclave. Rossett walked gaily along. He would have a precious hour with Isabel. In a dark street two men came up behind him. One pinioned his arms from behind. Somoza pressed a saturated handkerchief over his face. In a few seconds the unfortunate young diplomatist was drugged and helpless. A cab driven by a member of the Brotherhood had crawled slowly after the two men. As soon as the driver saw what had happened, he drove rapidly up. The two powerful men lifted the inert body into the vehicle. He was partially recovered when they halted at the house where the tribunal of five was sitting to pronounce judgment on the man who had dared to thwart their plans. They locked him in a room adjoining that in which Contreras was presiding over the deliberations of his five trusted lieutenants. After locking him in securely, Somoza went to report the matter to Moreno. His colleague, the other Biscayan fisherman, remained on guard outside the closed door for fear of untoward accidents. Rossett was a powerful man. Contreras, with his fine intellectual face, his hair in places turning from iron gray to white, looked the embodiment of dignified justice. Perhaps in his warped and fanatical mind he believed he was. He spoke in his most judicial accents. Nobody shall ever say that he has not had a fair trial when brought up before the tribunal of the Brotherhood. We will wait an hour, if it is necessary, for this misguided young man to recover his senses. Moreno, who had arrived the last of the party, looked round with a sudden start. Where is our comrade, Violet Hargrave? Contreras hastened to explain. Ah, of course you have not heard. Alvadero went to bring her here, according to arrangement. He found her stretched on the sofa, motionless and inanimate. He thinks she is in a dying condition. He is going round to inquire after these proceedings are over. This is very sad, said Moreno, in his gravest manner. And she is such a nice woman personally, and so devoted to the cause through the influence of Jacques. I wonder, he cast an inquiring look at Alvedero, if by any chance she drinks or drugs. Many apparently nice women do. Alvedero shook his big head. I doubt it. I should say a seizure of some sort. Perhaps her heart is weak. She looks a little fragile. Moreno, for obvious reasons, did not pursue the subject. 
Violet Hargrave's absence had evidently excited no comment, no suspicion. A quarter of an hour had elapsed. Somoza was deputed to enter the locked room and ascertain the condition of the prisoner. Contreras was resolved to proceed justly according to his interpretation of the word justice. Somoza returned after his inspection and reported that the effects of the saturated handkerchief had worn off. Guy Rossett was, in a sense, clothed in his right mind. He was fit to face the tribunal. The members of the conclave assumed masks. Somoza had worn a mask when he had entered the locked room. Whatever happened, it was essential that Guy Rossett should not be able to identify any one of them. The prisoner or captive, whatever he might be called, was brought in. In the cab he had been bound securely round the legs and wrists, but not painfully. He was assisted to a chair by the masked Somoza, where he sat facing his judges. His face was a little pale due to the effects of the chloroform, but his demeanor was firm. He felt himself in a very tight corner, but he had been assured so often by Moreno that he need never despair. A good angel in the shape of Moreno himself was watching over him. He cast his glance rapidly over the masked men confronting him. Where was the black-browed young journalist whom he had known in the old days? There, on the right, nearest to the door. Had that position been chosen by accident or design? He recognized at once the short, squat figure. Through the holes of the mask he could see the gleam of those dark eyes. His demeanor would be more indomitable than ever. Contreras opened the proceedings in his most judicial manner. Mr. Rossett, you will recognize that you are now at the mercy of the Brotherhood, against whom for some time you have directed your activities. Quite true, replied Guy Rossett in his curtest manner. Whatever fate was in store for him, he was not going to knuckle under to this crew of bloodthirsty ruffians. Contreras continued in his calm, imperturbable manner. I cannot say that up to the present you have done us very much harm, but still you are a menace to our schemes, our aspirations. I am pleased to hear that I am of sufficient importance to justify this mock tribunal. Rossett waved his hand contemptuously at the masked men sitting in judgment on him. The eyes of Contreras flashed through his mask. He took his position very seriously. Mr. Rossett, let me advise you in your own interest not to carry matters with too high a hand. Kindly recognize your position. If you were seated in the Calle Fernanda El Santo, I admit you would be top dog. At the present moment the Brotherhood, here in this obscure house, in this obscure quarter of the city of Madrid, is in that enviable situation. A bitter retort was on Rossett's lips, but he thought he perceived an almost imperceptible gesture of warning from the short squat figure in the corner near the door. He temporized. The fortunes of war, I admit, are with you, sir. I am sorry I have not had the advantage of knowing whom I have the honor to address. Contreras was at heart a gentleman. He felt the sting of the rebuke. Mr. Rossett, if you come into line with us tonight, I may deal with you quite frankly. Before we separate, you may know as much about me as I do about you. There was an obvious movement on the part of Zorilta and Alverdero. They evidently thought their chief was going too far. Contreras hushed the incipient rebellion with an authoritative wave of his hand. Gentlemen, kindly leave me to deal with this matter. Mr. Rossett and I will understand each other in a very few moments. He turned towards the young diplomatist, still undaunted in the midst of this hostile crowd. Mr. Rossett, you have much to lose by opposing us, perhaps life itself. By withdrawing from this unequal contest, and believe me, it is unequal, you have much to gain. I am not so sure it is unequal, answered Guy Rossett stubbornly. He had perceived too late the warning signal of Moreno, anxious that the somewhat uncertain Contreras should not be deflected from his present calm judicial mood. But Contreras kept his temper. Mr. Rossett, you are a young man, with life, a happy and prosperous life, before you. I know a good deal about you. It is my business to know much about other people. You are engaged to a very charming girl. You will inherit a great fortune from a wealthy aunt. 
and if you could establish your principles broke in guy speaking with some heat you might take away from me my fiancee you would certainly rob me of my fortune but contreras was still patient he was trying to reason with this obstinate young man whose bold bearing moved his admiration we cannot tell how the great revolution will shape itself ultimately but let us deal with present facts a charming girl is waiting for you longing for the moment when she can be your wife a shadow of pain passed over guy's face to-night he had set out to visit his beloved isabel and he had been snared contreras watched him naturally through the eyes of his mask and a big fortune will be yours very shortly are you prepared to give up these advantages for the sake of thwarting the brotherhood i rather think i am but tell me what you propose i admit you are arguing in a most temperate fashion but you have something up your sleeve all the same i have admitted contreras frankly mr rossett believe me i have no personal animosity against you except as the tool of a decaying and effete system come into line with me and your bonds shall be loosed and you shall go forth a free man your conditions queried rossett in a hard voice take your solemn oath no give me your word as an english gentleman i will accept that that you will resign your position at the embassy and take no further action against the brotherhood he rose and pointed at the door give me that promise mr rossett and you can walk out a free man if guy hesitated a moment his hesitation must be pardoned in that swift instant he thought of isabel anxiously waiting his arrival his dear sister mary anxious and troubled also even his father whose maladroit interference in his affairs had sent him into this hotbed of disaffection then he spoke slowly and deliberately you invite me to dishonor myself in order to secure my own personal safety my answer is no do your worst you will not reconsider that decision mr rossett guy shook his head no a thousand times no do what you like with me i am a defenseless man you can murder me here and probably hush up your crime but i shall be avenged you can reckon on that contreras rose and paced the room in great agitation he was a brave man himself he admired the quality of bravery in others fanatical and resolute as he was it went against the grain to condemn this young englishman to death because he would not accept the dishonorable terms offered to him mr rossett i wish to spare you the brotherhood does not condemn in haste he turned to somoza take this gentleman to his room and bring him here in a quarter of an hour perhaps by that time he will take a more reasonable view of his position come senor if you please said the obedient somoza speaking through his mask in the most polite tones a spaniard is always courteous even if he is about to murder you the fisherman bent down to assist his prisoner to rise but before rossett was firmly on his legs the short squat figure of moreno got up from his chair he laid his finger to his lips and looked round at the assembly silence gentlemen for a moment i am sure i heard the sound of a whistle yes there is another one did you catch it no nobody had caught it except moreno he stole gently to the window and pulled the blind an inch aside he dropped it hastily and staggered back in a state of extreme agitation in that apparently unconscious movement he had drawn nearer to the door dios he cried in a shrill voice the house is surrounded there are dozens of men outside the pulling aside of the blind was a signal he had arranged with his friend the head of the police the pretense of the whistle was a blind there was a heavy trampling on the stairs almost before he had ceased speaking the locked door was burst open to admit the members of the police with level revolvers covering the masked men two of the unwelcome visitors seized somoza and handcuffed him a third cut the secure but not painful ropes that bound rossett and conducted him down the narrow staircase a cab was waiting his guardian bundled the young man in was it a dream isabel's soft arms were round him isabel's soft voice was whispering to him my darling you are safe moreno has kept his promise rossett was bewildered no wonder he had hardly yet recovered from the effects of the drug which had been administered by somoza 
His head fell back on her shoulder. Isabel, my dear sweetheart, you, here, what does it mean? It means that you are saved through Moreno and my cousin Maurice Farquhar. She felt it was no time to palter with the truth. Your cousin, Maurice Farquhar? What has he to do with it all? She was pleased to note that there was no suspicion in his tones, only the expression of bewilderment. Oh, it would take hours to explain, but I will cut it as short as I can. My cousin and Moreno are great friends. Maurice has come over here to help him. I was expecting you tonight, as you will remember. Maurice came round to explain that you had been kidnapped. He was coming on here as Moreno's lieutenant to help the police. I implored him to take me along, to welcome you when you escaped from them. He consented, and here I am. Guy clasped her in his arms. You darling, and where is Mr. Farquhar? I would like to thank him. Isabel beckoned to a man standing a little way in the shadow. He advanced. Maurice, Guy wishes to thank you for all your share in this night's work. The two men exchanged the cordial handshake. Guy muttered his thanks. I would like to tell you to drive off straight away, said Farquhar, but you must wait a minute or two. There will be a third occupant of this vehicle, our friend Moreno, who is going to pass the night at the house of the chief of police. Tomorrow he will go to England. In the room from which Rossett had been conducted to his friendly guardian, the head of the police was taking the situation in hand. Mast off if you please, gentlemen, he cried out in stentorian tones. The men turned hesitatingly to each other, but the level revolvers had an eloquence that was very appealing. They tore off their masks and flung them on the floor. The chief scrutinized them in turn, offering audible comments. Ah, Contreras, the dark horse of the conspiracy, connected with the Spanish nobility through your wife. I think I have met you at court. Avadero, ah, for some time you have been suspect. Zerilta, I know you well governor of the province of Neva. He pointed to Somoza. This gentleman I do not know. We shall find something about him later on. He turned to Moreno, who preserved an impassive demeanor. I have not the honor of knowing this gentleman either, he said, with a splendid disregard of the truth for which Moreno admired him immensely. But no doubt I shall shortly atone for my ignorance. I shall have something to say to him later on. He turned to his subordinates, handcuffed them, and take them along. Moreno, all the time, had been edging nearer to the door. Suddenly he pulled out a knife and hurled himself at the man who was guarding it. The man went down before the apparently savage onslaught. Moreno rushed down the stairs. After him, yelled the chief. Don't let that man escape. Three of the waiting men clattered down the stairs after the flying Moreno. They returned a few moments later, crestfallen. They explained that he had flown like the wind, that they had lost him in the darkness. The chief swore roundly and cursed them. Dolts, idiots, he cried fiercely. You have let him slip through your fingers. I believe he is the most dangerous man of the lot. He was certainly playing his part splendidly. It had, of course, all been rehearsed. The man on whom Moreno had sprung had fallen down of his own accord. The men who had been dispatched to pursue him had lost him on purpose. Farquhar met him at the door of the shabby house and piloted him to the cab in which Guy Rossett and Isabel were seated. Here is the third passenger, he said. Moreno got in and looked triumphantly at the two. Well, what do you think of the English Secret Service? he cried in exultant tones. Mr. Rossett is saved, I have escaped without suspicion, and my good friend the Chief of Police will make a splendid haul upstairs. He played up splendidly. Well, I think after tonight, the anarchist movement will have a big setback in Spain. The cab drove along. Isabel was deposited at the Godwins. Rossett was put down at his own flat. Moreno was conveyed to the residence of the chief of police, where he was to pass the night. A telegram was awaiting Guy. It was from his sister Mary. I was summoned to Aunt Henrietta this morning. She had passed away before I had arrived. End of chapter 22. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks.com.